Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Danielle and I have a fun lesson today. It's about contrary passages. And Danielle, before we get into these contrary passages, would you pray for us? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we want to invoke your presence here with us at this study. There are passages that many times Christians around the world use them for different purposes and to say something different than what the Bible says overall. Lord, we ask that your presence be with us, that your Holy Spirit guide us and open our eyes and uh, our ears and our hearts so that we would hear the message clearly from you. Please um, guide us through the study. On 539, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So part of, of what we do when we come to Christ is we start searching the scriptures to learn what it is he has to teach us. And it's interesting because when I talk with people and at, talk to them about giving Bible studies or getting involved or reaching out and talking to people, they have a fear of doing this. And they'll say, you know, I, I really don't know my Bible that well. I'm not, I'm not sure I should be doing that. So today, we're going to help um, with some of those difficult questions and difficult answers and those scriptures that people often use that aren't quite interpreted how they think they're interpreted. So today we're going to prepare you for these difficult questions. So Peter warns us, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope in you. Um, 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense for anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. So we don't have to be bold about it. We can do it meekly. And we don't have to be, be difficult with people. But we use the meekness and reverence that God gave us. Paul adds, preach the word. 2 Timothy, 2, 4, 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 3 says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they, they have itching ears, they will heap up all themselves for themselves teachers. So the time will come, and is probably here in many places, that people don't want to hear the sound doctrines. The difficult things, but they want to hear the easy prosperity kinds of, of words from the, book of, from the book of the Lord. This being the case, we should not look only to those passages that can easily be explained to fit our beliefs, but also passages that are commonly used to teach something different than what we believe. Every species of delusion is now being brought in the plainest truths of God's word are covered with a mass of man-made theories. Deadly errors are presented as truth to which all must bow. The simplicity of true godliness is buried beneath tradition. And many of these uh, false theories come more from tradition than from studying the word of God. So Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will come, not come unless there's a falling away first, and the man of, and the man of is, is revealed, the son of perdition. Ephesians 5.6 says, Let no one deceive you with any empty arguments that encourage you to sin. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon sons of disobedience. So we see that the Bible tells us that we need to be on guard to not be deceived by, <clears throat> by um, spiritual untruths. Jeremiah 29, 8, 
For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams, which you cause to be dreamed. Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to that word, is because there's no light in him. So we need to make sure that who, when we're listening to pastors, that we are listening to pastors of light. I've had Bible studies with people, and they come with all kinds of questions. And I know that they've been listening to ministers who don't have, have really true light in them. Isaiah 42, 16, I will bring the blind by the way that they did not know. I will lead them into paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. So when we go out to give studies and to share God's word with people, we need to remember that he's the one who will lead us in the way we should, we should go. The doctrine of the natural immortality of the soul is one error with which, which with the enemy is deceiving man. And this error is nearly universal. This is one of the lies forged in the synagogue of the enemy, one of the poisonous drafts of Babylon. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven, uh, from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may be not partakers of her sins, and that ye may not receive of her plagues. And that is from Evangelism 247. So this week, we'll study some intriguing passages that people use to justify the natural immortality of the soul. These reflections should strengthen our own convictions and help us to answer kindly those questions in crucial teaching. So Danielle, you are going to share with us Sunday's lesson about the rich man in Lazarus. And that is one that is used often. Quite a, quite a bit. And first, we're going to get started right away because we have a lot of ground to cover. Now, this uh, is a parable. Um, a lot of people try to use it literally and try to state that it's saying something that it's not. But let's look at it. First of all, we've got to find where in the Bible it's located. And it is on Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. But before we actually review it, we need to know what, what comes right before it. So right before it is actually the parable of the dishonest uh, steward. Uh, and starts the same way with the same words as this particular one. Nobody takes that one of anything as a parable. I mean, it's universally accepted as a parable. Yet when they get to this one, they get stuck on it and they all are, try to treat it literally because it substantiates their beliefs at some point in time. But let's review it first. So the rich man and Lazarus, chapter, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. And let's read it. There was a certain rich man, it starts in the same way as the previous parable, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. This is all happening here on earth. Desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. So we have a beggar that's sitting. He's obviously at the gate of the rich man. And he says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. I mean, he was in such a condition that he couldn't even show away the dogs. They were just coming to him. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And this is where people start really substantiating their beliefs. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in the torments in Hades, first of all, Hades is, uh, Hades translated usually is grave, but here there is a point that's trying to be made, so let's continue read it. And he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water 
and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented, like you reversed spots. You, you changed locations. He's being in a good place and you're in a bad place. And besides all this between us, you, there is a great gulf fixed. In other words, there's a big divide between where you are and where he is. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot know those from their past to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, so this is the rich man talking, I beg you, therefore, Father, in other words, Father Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house. Like, if he cannot come to me here and I cannot go to him, at least send him back to earth to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment, like they're going to end up like me. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rises from the dead. So this is a parable. We can see already from the beginning and the end. First of all, it comes after the dishonest uh, steward. And the dishonest steward, the point of the parable of the previous parable is that the dishonest steward took the opportunity to set himself a future while he was before moving on. And here it's in reverse order. It's basically saying you have to take care of things, like making the same point, but from, from the reverse, like you cannot go back. He's basically, this parable is saying you cannot go back to fix. You, you take care of things while you're on earth because there's no changes after that. Um, but it's the same point that Jesus is making, making to them just in reverse order. But why we're not to take this literal? It's because we have quite a bit of texts in the Bible that will help us understand the fact that some of these things that they portrayed here as a parable are not literal. Um, so one thing that we're going to look quickly at is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 where he tells us, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. So in other words, nothing can be communicated, known, that's not changed. And he says they have no more reward. There's nothing they can be rewarded after death, for the memory of them is forgotten. So once your chances are here on earth, there is dead know nothing, and the dead have no more reward afterwards. And we have other texts. We have actually quite a few texts that we've studied in the past about, but let's just underline a few of them uh, for now, just so for our understanding. Psalm 146.4 says, his spirit, in other words, the one that died, the breath, the spirit, departs, and he returns to his earth, like he goes back into the earth. So when someone dies, his breath returns, and he ends up in, in the earth. In that very day, his plans perish. So it's like the end. His spirit is gone, like his breath is gone, the body's in the dirt, and his plans have disappeared. And that's just a couple of texts. Uh, there's another one, Hebrews 9:27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. This is the point, you know, it's like when we were reading the parable, we're talking about Father Abraham trying to make supposed negotiations for his future, I mean, for his uh, changes of the, you know, his past supposedly, and now he's trying to make changes after life. And this text tells us in Hebrew 9.27 that as it is appointed for men to die once, but after that, it's just a judgment. There is no change. It's just judgment comes. So that's uh, another point that cannot be taken literal in here. The other thing, there's another ch text that uh, underlines the same point that we are not given a second chance in heaven. Uh, our chance is in this lifetime. So what's the point of this parable? Let's just kind of review things very quickly. And the, the point of the parable is really in the ending, 
where it says that they, when uh, Father Abraham supposedly responds that there is a great gulf and there is no change afterwards. There's just no way to cross back or forth. There's no way of changing your situation after the fact. And it also tells them that there is no reason for anyone to go back from heaven to talk to them. There is no possibility of that. And that if they didn't hear the Moses and the prophets, like our scriptures, they wouldn't be persuaded even if somebody came from the dead. So let's look at Isaiah 26.10. Let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. So even if you are giving grace many times, like it was saying in the end of the parable, that if they won't hear from Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly. So like if you give them a second chance and you'll allow them to go to heaven, then in the land of uprightness, which is in heaven, he will deal unjustly. So God will not give them a second chance because there's no reason to give a second chance. They won't change after the fact. And so on and so forth. I um, like to underline something because our time is very short here. Is that um, I may I have to take two more minutes on this. It was almost prophetic when Jesus did this parable. He basically said to them, "If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rises from the dead." And when we look at what happened, it's almost like very short time after this parable was spoken by Jesus, Lazarus passed away. And as we know the story, he was resurrected by Jesus. And what happened? Uh, in John 11, chapter 43 to 54, uh, it's the story of what happened after Lazarus. Now when Jesus had just, is just resurrecting him and says, now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave, great grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. And what happens right after? Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs, and literally they proceed in the next few verses to make plans to kill Jesus. More than that, they even make plans when we're looking at uh, the next text in John 12, 9 to 10, to even kill Lazarus. It says, now many of great of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. So just like the parable uh, ended, where, Je where the, in the parable Jesus told them, if they do not hear Moses and the pro prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rise from the dead. That's exactly what happened with Lazarus. It's like shortly thereafter, Jesus resurrected Lazarus. He came from the dead after being in the tomb for three days. And what did the Fer chief Pharisees uh, do? They plotted to kill Jesus. It's not like they, not only they didn't believe, they went even further in their disbelief and plotted to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Alrighty. The next uh, scripture we're going to look at comes to us from Luke 23, 43. And the first time someone hit me with this scripture, I really couldn't answer the question. I had to go, I had to go back and study this. So Luke 23, 43, he replied, truly I tell you, today you shall be with me in paradise. So almost all Bible versions, with few exceptions, translate the scripture in a similar way, giving the impression that on the very day Christ died, Christ and the thief would be together in paradise. This should not surprise us because those translations were made by biblical scholars who believe in the dogma of the natural immortality of the soul. But, it, but is it the best translation for the text? So we're going to look at some text, and um, you can decide for yourself 
whether that is the best translation or not. So we're, we see, surely I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Or is it saying, surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. John 20, 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now this verse in John 20, 17 makes us go a little bit about, hmm, because if Christ was in heaven that day with the thief on the cross, how is it that he's telling Mary that he hasn't been to heaven yet? So we find this contradictory to that text. John 14, 1 to 3, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in my, me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I would have... I will go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So we see in this text that God is leaving, and he's coming back for us. He's not taking us with him to heaven. He is coming back to get us to take us to heaven. So these scriptures really do not align with Luke 23, 43. So how should the promise of the repentant thief on the cross be understood in light of Jesus' words to Mary Magdalene and his promises to his disciples? So the assumption that Christ and the thief went to, to the same paradise or heaven contradicts Jesus' words to Mary after his resurrection. The error that both Jesus and the repentant thief went to heaven, that day also contradicts the, pro the promise of his second coming. So the issue in Luke 23, 43, is whether the verb today, which is the Greek word samaron, should be linked to the verb that follows it to be, or the verb that precedes it to tell. And our lesson says that Wilson Porchy recognizes that from the grammatical standpoint, it is virtually impossible to determine the corrective alternative. Luke, however, has a definite tendency to use this adverb with the preceding verb. This happens in 14 of the 20 occurrences of Samaron in Luke and Acts. And that is, uh, that's uh, an analysis we see from Ministry Magazine. So the most natural reading of Luke 23, 43 should be, Surely I tell you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. In this case, the idiomatic expression, I tell you today, emphasizes the relevance and sol solemnity of the statement. And you will be with me in paradise. In short, Jesus was promising him right then and there that he would be saved. And what a, what a beautiful picture that Christ would immediately save a thief on the cross who had faith in him. So let's read this story about the repentant thief. Luke 23, 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are Christ, save you yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's when God said, basically, I will. I will tell you this Right now, you're going to be in heaven with me. And what a beautiful promise because this thief admitted that he didn't deserve to go to heaven. He admitted that uh, he deserved the reward he was getting on the cross and that Christ didn't. And yet he had the faith to say to him, 
We see him repent, and we see him asking Christ to save him. So um, despite the fact that he had nothing to offer God, was promised eternal life by Jesus. So what a, this is just a powerful story. And um, there are other scriptures, too, in the Bible where commas are misplaced. The original language we see in Hebrew does not have punctuation, and that man um, had to put the punctuation in. So that left it up to the translators to best determine the place of punctuation. And there's another um, scripture in Acts 19.12, uh, which is, I use this one because it, it makes me giggle when I read it. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So the way it's written, it sounds like the handkerchiefs and were, the handkerchiefs were sick, <laughs> and so were the aprons, and they had to have the diseases taken out of them. So we see that. <clears throat> that even though the translators did their best, uh, at times they, had, they have misplaced commas. So when Jesus said, and I'm going to read from Ellen White, SDA Bible commentary here. So when Jesus said to Mary, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, when he closed his eyes in death upon the cross, the soul of Christ did not go at once to heaven, as many believe, or how could this word be true? I am not yet ascended to my father. The spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body and did not wing off to heaven, there to maintain separate existence and to look down upon the mourning disciples embalming the body from which it had been taken. All that comprom comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remained with his body in the sepulcher, and when he came forth, it was a whole being. He did not have to summon his spirit from heaven. He had power to lay down his life and take it up again. So Danielle, <clears throat> you are going to share with us, depart and be with Christ. Very good. So this is another text. This is another text that uh, on Tuesday we're looking at another text that is uh, many times put forth to, to state that people are departing and going to heaven after they die. But let's review and see what it says uh, and what's the context and so on and so forth. So here we go. The text is uh, verse 23 in chapter, it's chapter 1, Philippians 21 to 24. We're going to read the entire section, but we're going to hone in on verse 23 when we get to it. So let's start with verse 21. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my, la from my labor. Yet shall I choose? I can't. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So what is this saying? First of all, who's talking? It's the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Philippians. Uh, and as he's writing to the Philippians, where is he writing from? And what's the context of his life at that time? He is in prison. So for the context, we'll look a little bit in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. And here it is, he's saying, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard he is in, the, in Rome and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's imprisoned. He is at the time being and why is he imprisoned? He is in prison because he's representing Christ. And what's the effect on him? He's basically saying, it's given me the opportunity to, to preach to the people in the palace and the guards. And my fellow believers have become even bolder because of my chains. And in that note, he's telling them that he, for him to live is with Christ is gain. But he 
you know, the labors, he, he would be ready to go to the Lord. He would be, he, like he says, I having a desire to depart, like to go to rest and be with Christ, which is far better. So this little text, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, is what a lot of Christians say to justify that Jesus is, like when he's dying, he's going to go up to heaven to be with Christ. However, it's the Apostle Paul. We have a lot of writings from the Apostle Paul explaining what happens when you die to misunderstand. It's like we have too many of his own words to come back and underline even for our own knowledge. Here goes one. Writing to the Philippians again. Uh, no. Actually, we're going to jump on to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. So he's now writing to the Thessalonians. And he's explaining what happens when you die. It's, uh, and why is he writing to the Thessalonians? The Thessalonians, a lot of their believers were starting to die off. And they were all expecting for the Lord to come. And they were saying, when is the Lord going to come? Our believers are dying. And in reply, he writes, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died, they have fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Okay. That could be misunderstood too, but let's continue because it's clarified in the next verses. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive. So Paul is believing that he's going to be alive till Jesus returns. At least that's what he's saying. And that some of the believers will be alive then. And remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Why? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So where are they? They are dead in Christ. And they, at the second coming, they will rise first with the shout of the archangel. So very clear delineation of what's happening to someone when he dies. That's what the Apostle Paul believed. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, like those that have been resurrected, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So again, the review is what happens is those that are dead are in Christ are asleep in the ground. And some, like maybe we, will be alive when Jesus returns. And those that are asleep will be called out to the shot of the archangel out of the grave. They'll be resurrected. They'll meet the those that are alive and together will be risen up and meet the Lord in the air. So that is really what the Apostle Paul believes. So that's, it's very clear that he is wanting to rest. He's thinking that resting when he's done his job is sufficient. Uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to underline is also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54. This is the Apostle Paul again talking to the Corinthians now. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, some of us will be alive when the Lord returns. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. When? When Jesus returns as the second coming and the dead in Christ will be called out. The, the shout of the archangel and the trumpet of God. For the trumpet will sound... And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Here's another clear uh, underlining of where the dead are. Dead in the ground, called out to be resurrected. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So when is death swallowed up in victory? At the second coming, at the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Um, we have quite a few other texts, but what I wanted to kind of like discuss a little bit, what, when it comes to the Apostle Paul, he has, his mind was all about doing the service of the Lord all through his life. But he also knew that his time was coming close. Um, he is, was imprisoned, 
and he didn't he wished to continue ministering to the Christ, Christian brothers and sisters and the believers but he knew that his rest would be coming soon and he didn't look at it as a loss he first of all he lived his life with gusto and full-fledged service I mean he was a powerful witness for the Lord in his life he wasn't a uh, what was me kind of Christian but he also looked forward to the rest of well done and faithful servant and resting in the grave because he knew that once you go to sleep the moment you are asleep dead but when you rise up you open your eyes and you see the Lord so it's like a moment from death to resurrection when you're asleep you don't know anything just like we read in the previous day's text that when you're asleep you know nothing um, I want to kind of close with one text that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy it's also in his sort of last times and he said for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand this is really was his mentality he knew his time was coming uh, and he is describing himself like that I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not to me only but also to all who have loved his appearing so he is clearly underlining when he's gonna see Christ at his appearing at Jesus' second coming that's another word for the second coming of Jesus in the Bible the appearing so we can see we, what uh, Paul was thinking of and I hope that we also can say along with him I have fought the good fight and I have uh, uh, finished the race and I have kept the faith and we will also see him at his appearing thank you so Wednesday we're going to look at preaching to the spirits in prison and we think about preaching to the spirits in prison we have to think of this prison of sin that uh, we are in in this world. So let's read 1 Peter 3, 13 through 20. Who is there to harm you if you, you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks and to give account for that hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience so that the thing which you are slandered those who revile you your good behavior in Christ will put it to shame for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for what for doing what is right rather than for what is doing wrong for Christ also died for sin once for all the just for the just and the unjust so that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh made alive in the spirit so God was made alive after his death for us in which so he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah and we see that this was they're talking about here the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few that is eight persons were brought safely through the water so we see <clears throat> in this text that Christ died for us and became alive and so he went to and, and so we see now that this proclamation was made to those who um, were struggling in sin just as they did with Noah in the construction of the ark yeah <clears throat> so we see that this notion that Christ when he died in when he when he died went and preached to spirits in prison um, while he was still resting in the tomb just doesn't quite work in in the context of scripture 
So there is no second chance once we, are, we have dead. And we're going to look at some scriptures again. We've talked about these before, but we're going to look at them again. Because we've, we've already talked about it being appointed once for man to die, and then the judgment. So Christ offered once to bear the sins for many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So Christ <clears throat> would preach to all of those so that no one would, have a, would, not, would lose their salvation if they chose him. Meanwhile, and most important, this theory contradicts biblical teachings that the dead remain unconscious. We see that in Job 14, 10 through 12. Man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? Water disappears from the sea and a river becomes parched and dries up. So man lies down and does not raise up till the heavens are no more. So man doesn't rise again till the heavens are no more. Psalms 146, the spirits depart and he returns to the earth. His plans perish. Ecclesiastics 9, 5, and 10, we know the dead know nothing. And whatever their hands, hand finds to do, we do it with our might, for there's no work or device or knowledge in the grave. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 6 to 8, for the dead do not rise. If the dead don't rise, then the, do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And 1 Thessalonians, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brother, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest ye sorrow and have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so, God will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. So we see over and over and over in the Bible <clears throat> that once we go to our grave, we are, we are in soul sleep. Also, <clears throat> if this verse were really saying that Jesus, while bodily in the tomb, went down to hell and preached to the wicked and to the Luvians, why did only they hear the message? So why was it just the Antediluvians that heard the message? Were no other people lost, burning in hell with them? And why would he only preach to them? So it really doesn't make sense that he would just go down to the grave and, and uh, preach to them. It also is senseless to suggest that Christ preached to fallen angels who had been disobedient in Noah's day. While the spirits in prisons are described as having been formally disobedient. The Bible speaks of evil angels as still disobedient today. Ephesians 6:12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in heavenly places. And 1 Peter 5:8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Furthermore, the fallen angels are kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains of judgment until that great day. And we see, too, that <clears throat> at the end, for a thousand years, Satan will be chained to um, the bottomless pit. Jude 6 says, Angels who do not keep their proper dominion but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting change and darkness for the judgment of that great day without opportunity for salvation. We also notice in 1 Peter 3 that the spirits in prisons of verse 19 are, are identified in verse 20 as the disobedient antediluvians in the day of Noah. The term spirit, Greek, that's used here is pneuma. And pneuma means breath, which is, which is, is life. And is used in the text elsewhere in the New Testament in reference to living people who can hear and accept the invitation of salvation. So when we talk about the pneuma, or the spirit, it's always talking about those who are alive. The expression in, privy, in prison obviously refers not to little prison, but to prison of sin in which the unregenerated human nature is found. So Christ's preaching to the impenitent Andaluvians was accomplished through Noah, who was divinely instructed by God. Hebrews 11.7 7 says, By faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared the ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world 
and became heir of righteousness, which is according to the faith. And he became a preacher of righteousness. Second Peter says, and did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. So Peter's verses were written in context of what it means to be faithful. They're not a commentary on the state of the dead. So Danielle, we've got one more here, don't we? Yes, Thursday. We've got Thursday, and oh, these souls under the altar. So here's another one that uh, many times it's told to us <coughs> that souls go to heaven under the altar, etc., etc. Before we actually look at the text, the text is in Revelation chapter 6, and it's in verse 9 through 11. But before we look at that, I would like to see where we're placed. This chapter in Revelation is all about prophetic vision. It's John is in vision. So I'd like to see what is being presented right before. So we're going to look first at verses 1 through 8. So I'm going to start reading. We're not going to explain in detail every verse, but they'll give us a very clear indication of where we're, what we're looking at. So here goes, Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. First seal, the conqueror, that's really what is that first few verses. And it says, now I saw, who's writing? It's John, John seeing in vision. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, going right along. Verse 3. It, it's really, verse 3 starts a second seal, and it's the conflict on earth. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So we can see there's a lot of tribulations and killing and going on on earth. There is no peace on earth. Third seal, scarcity on earth, and it says, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, scales as in weighing scales. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So there's like, everything is very expensive, and it's difficult. Fourth seal starts in verse 7 widespread death on earth. That's really what it's all about. And he says, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death and hate is followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death and by the beasts of the earth. So we're looking at a lot of tribulation, a lot of Horrible things are happening on the earth. And here comes the verses we're looking at. The verses that we're basing, where this text that we're going to analyze is starting here. And it's what it is. It's the fifth seal. It's the cry of the martyrs. And here it goes. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. What we can see here is they're saying that their voices are under the altar. It also saying that they are crying out for uh, judgment. They're basically that they would be revenged, avenged. And what is the response? Rest a little while longer. So obviously they're told to wait a little while longer because it's not time. Because they're waiting. And what are they waiting for? Until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So in other words, there'll be more people martyred until it's the end of time. 
This is very clear that this symbolizes the fifth seal was presented to encourage those who faced martyrdom and death with the assurance that despite the seeming triumph of the enemy, the vindication would ultimately come. Such an encouragement would be particularly heartening for, for those that would be reading the Bible during the times of the persecution. And that's really what this message is for. It was is to during the times of Reformation and the Middle Ages and possibly even for us coming up, it's a message of encouragement that God is, has a time of retribution. Now, uh, it's very obvious that we're talking at something not literal, um, but more than that, we have plenty of words in the scriptures to tell us uh, what happens to someone when, die, when, what they, when they die. We've already studied in, in Genesis. First of all, the Revelation was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in, uh, like Genesis was written in Hebrew. So when Hebrew, when we studied in the very beginning creation, we knew that a soul was a living being. It was made up of the breath of life from God and uh, the body, and in combination it became a living soul. It's just that the language is different, uh, so they cannot, it doesn't have the same, we cannot say, oh, it's sitting the same here and the same there, because it's two different languages. However, we have other ways to verify the information. Let's look at Revelation 14, 13. Where are the martyred saints now? Are they under, in heaven? Where are they? What does it tell us in Revelation? Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So they're resting. They're resting. But what's also very significant is that it's talking about an altar. And where is this altar? It's obviously there's blood under the altar. If we think of the Old Testament, we had two altars in the temple. One was in the most holy place in the presence of God, like where the Shekinah glory was. And the other one was in the antechamber, the chamber in front, where there were dues the blood. Actually, that was not the altar. That was like the showbread and so on and so forth. The actual altar where the sacrifice was, was right outside in the courtyard. And that's where the blood was being um, sprinkled on. That's where the sacrifice was. That was the representation of uh, Christ's death on that altar and his paying for our sins. And the blood was also sprinkled there. So it would not be, and that was a portrayal of the earth. Like when you're looking at the sanctuary, the inner part of the sanctuary where the um, altar of incense was, was the representation of the heavenly, like the throne of God. And the outer courtyard was a representation of earth where Jesus was going to pay with his life, the sacrifice. So obviously, this is not a literal altar in heaven. It's a representation symbolically. We saw that we were in vision. Then the second thing is, after the saints are given white garments, as it says in that text, that represents the righteousness of Christ. The martyrs are told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, are killed just as they have been. Literally, they are told to rest a little while longer. That means they're not alive, they're just resting. So we can see the symbolism here. And we also know in the Revelation 24 to 6 that the saints are not going to be with Christ except after the second coming. And in Revelation 5.13, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. That's the time we're going to be with them after the second coming when we're going to be with them, with, with Christ. Thank you. You know, when I hear this, it, it reminds me of Genesis 4.10 where when, uh, when God came to uh, Abel and said, did the blood, or came to Cain and said, did the blood of Abel cry up from the ground? Yeah. So it's, it, it reminds me. It's symbolically. Me of, it's symbolic, yeah. 
because the blood wasn't quite crying there and it wasn't visible, it's just God could tell. Did you have any other final thoughts? Yeah, so my final thought is, really I would like to close mine up with my text on the last day that we said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Because I absolutely love those words of the Apostle Paul. I, I, I hope that we all can say with him, hanging on to faith and studying our Bibles and knowing the words that we can hang on and say, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering in the time of my departure at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Because keeping the faith, meaning knowing our Bible and not being deceived by anyone. Not listening to anyone, but listening only to the words of Scripture. All right. Um, my final thoughts are from the Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald from December 18, 1888. And it has to do with this, this thought has to do with us knowing our scriptures. It says, we must come to the sure word of prophecy for our authority. Unless we are intelligent in the scriptures, we may not, when this mighty miracle working power of Satan is manifested in our world, be deceived and call it the workings of God. For the word of God declares that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. Mm -hmm. Unless we are rooted and grounded in the truth, we shall be swept away by Satan's divisive snares. We must cling to our Bibles. If Satan can make you believe that there are things in the word of God that are not inspired, he will then be prepared to ensnare your soul. Mm -hmm. We shall have no assurance, no certainty, at the very time we need it to know what the truth is. So <clears throat> as we study these, these questionable scriptures, we learn then what the truth really is, and so we will not be deceived. Indeed. So let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful lesson. We thank you for these scriptures that... Um, people get confused with. We're thankful, Lord, that you have given us answers and truth to what is being taught here. So, Lord, we pray with, that you will go with us today for a wonderful Sabbath and that we will continue in our worship with you, and we look forward to your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>